Morning, church. It is a good day to be alive. We are grateful that we are here where our congregation is seeking Christ and sharing his love. Hope you experience that while you are in our midst. And if you are with us virtually, we are grateful that you are with us as well. It is good to be together. Our call to worship this morning comes from the psalmist. Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God. I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession that you'll find printed in your bulletin this morning. Lover of justice, distinctions become blurred when we are called on to serve you. We have been taught to serve you is to obey you. At times, fidelity to others gets in our way. Societal pressures Feel that sense of security that speaks to our welfare. More customs no mandates. Higher loyalties are put aside. We can 
confess our mixed allegiance. Have mercy upon us as we face obligations and reclaim us from error when we obey not. Sisters and brothers, the Lord's mercy, grace, and forgiveness extends from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven. to take this time and find the connection card printed in your bulletin to fill it out and let us know that you're worshiping with us. And on the back of that card, there's a place for you to offer prayers and to respond uh, to some things. If you check confidential, only our pastors will see your prayers. Otherwise, our elders, our deacons, and our prayer teams will pray with and for you today and throughout the week. For those of you worshiping online, we're so glad you're with us this morning as well. And you have a connection card also, just above the live feed. Uh, it says connection card, and you can share your prayers with us also. A few brief announcements I'd like to draw your attention to. All of these are outlined in the back of the bulletin with uh, some others as well. But the first one is VBS is tonight, tomorrow night, and Tuesday night. There is something for all ages, from infants to kids to adults. Uh, you have to, if you are coming, please register online. If you forget or you haven't, um, you can show up anyway. Dinner's at 5.15 in First Hall, and then the adults will come in here at 6 p.m. for a class while the children go off for their programming. Um, so please join us. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Dana Cavallero, a great friend of our congregation um, and a professor at Regent, and it promises to be a rich, rich time, so please be with us. There's an insert in your bulletin as well I'd like to draw your attention to. Today is the last day to participate in the Jaycox Uniform Drive. This is a great opportunity for us to continue to be a partner with Jay Cox Elementary School and this beautiful relationship that we have with them um, through the Urban Renewal Center. So everything, as you know, the cost of groceries, the cost of everything is going up. That includes school uniforms as well. So it's $25 per uniform and you can help to support the students by purchasing one or two or 20 uniforms, however many you would like. Um, simply place that in the offering, or you can go to the kiosk in the welcome area after church, and you can uh, purchase them there. If you do place it in the offering, we ask that you put it in an envelope. You can find them in the pew back, and write on them, J. Cox Elementary School Uniform Drive, and we will be sure that they get uh, to where they are going. So with that, sisters and brothers, I invite you to stand and to greet one another.
because Arlie has summer work and we haven't started. Have you started yours? Sadly, yes. Sadly, yes. That's excellent because you're ahead of the Johnson family. Quite honestly, Vivian, the child that lives in my house can't even name all the books she's supposed to read this summer. So we are going to be spending the month of August doing a lot of reading, so I brought some math problems here so you could help Arlie out ahead of time. So hold on, so what's five plus two? Seven. Nine. Six plus three is nine. So only one of us know math. Okay. Four plus four is eight. Two plus three is five. And then one plus one is three. It's three. No, I think it's two. Well, listen, I was reading the scriptures that Jim is going to preach on, and it comes from the New Testament. And Jesus is talking, and he says, where two or more are gathered, Jesus is there. So I figured one plus one must be three, right? Well, I thought for sure, because the Bible says that. So I've been thinking about the fact that if we bring several of us together, and Jesus promises to be there, what a great opportunity we have to do that tonight at Vacation Bible School, right? So raise your hand if you're registered and you're coming. If you're not registered and coming, we are welcome you to register now. You can go online and register, and it's so much fun. We have free food. I've even ordered pizzas for kids that are picky eaters every single night. So food is great, and uh, food is going to be great. And then at 6 o'clock, our kids are going to have so much fun. And Miss Christina made me put on my uh, outer space suit um, that doubles as a Jiffy Loop suit. And um, so we're going to have the best time. And we hope that you come so we can be a church family just like the scripture that the gym is going to talk about says. So I'm going to close this in prayer and we hope to see all of you tonight because we have something like Joel said for everybody. So dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the reminder that your son told us that wherever two or more are gathered, Lord, you will be there. And thank you for the reminder that we have such a wonderful church family here at First Presbyterian, Lord. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together today, this morning in worship, and tonight in fellowship as we continue to learn more about you and your son and his magnificent gift and sacrifice, Lord. And we just pray that you will be here tonight as we seek to glorify you. In your heavenly name, amen. All right, kids, let's talk. Honor, you should have seen John Kroll's expression. John was a chair of the math department at ODU for years and years when you said one plus one is three. <laughs> myself. Uh, now, um, good to be together. Let me catch myself for a moment. So we're in the, we're in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to be looking at the 18th chapter. We're going to pick up at the 15th verse and go through the 20th. Now, we're spending, as I mentioned to you, we're spending the summer in Matthew. And last week, if you were with us, um, you remember that I said that we have a we're, um, we're looking at the Gospels as if every story, every miracle, every teaching of Jesus is a pearl. And each Gospel writer has a little bit different slant or intent. And so in that, the, the, the central pearl in Matthew we talked about last week, and it's the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the very first person that is a follower of Jesus who understands or at least begins to understand or recognize that he's the Messiah. Now, we're looking at a pearl that follows, and now Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death. He's preparing them for what it will be when he's gone. He's talking to them about the resurrection, and they're not grasping it yet, but this is sort of the theme. Now, in the 18th chapter, Matthew does something very, very interesting. He strings together some stories and teachings of Jesus that are about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, but they are all told in the perspective of a child. So Jesus says, unless a little child can come to me, unless you, you, if you keep them from coming to me, then, you know, he ties all of this into the kingdom of heaven. 
And now, as he finishes that, in the very mid-conversation, he starts with this, verse 15 in Matthew chapter 18. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Now, let's keep reading. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, which is the number of completion. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. That's the word of the Lord. Now, how many of you have ever written a resume? Okay. How many of you have ever written your eulogy? Got got a few hands. Okay. Okay. Now, David Brooks, who I think is just a, a great writer, David Brooks makes the distinction between what he calls resume virtues and eulogy virtues. And as Sahil Bloom, when he talks about Brooks, says this, resume virtues are the things you put on your resume, your professional accolades, education credentials, titles, status, net worth, and more. Eulogy virtues are the things people talk about at your funeral. Whether you had a clear purpose and worked with meaning, whether you were curious and interested, whether you were kind, loving, and trustworthy, whether you were a loyal friend, partner, and parent, and more. Now, Brooks would say to us that we spend much of our lives, most of our time, building our resume focusing on the resume virtues of what have you done, where have you gone to school, what profession do you have, what awards have you won, and we spend very little time on the eulogy ones, the ones that he says are absolutely critical. Now, both of them are important, but only when we get the correct directionality. So the sense is for us is that if we want to have a good life, It's not about what's on the resume to begin with. It's we begin with the end. We begin with the eulogy. It's on the things that that really matter. Really three questions. One is what really matters. The second is how do I want to live? And the third is what do I want to leave behind? What really matters? How do I want to live? And what do I want to leave behind? And if we start with that, the resume gets filled in, but the understanding of these virtues of ultimate importance get lifted up. Now for Jesus, Jesus, every story, every teaching, every miracle, every healing, every bit of Jesus is about writing his eulogy. He's writing it daily. There is absolutely nothing wasted in the Gospels not one word, there's not a throwaway story, there's not just one comment that just seems odd and is cast aside. Every bit of it, from the very beginning, the very first words that Jesus speaks, all the way through to his death and his resurrection, it's all about writing his eulogy daily. And Jesus always begins with the end in mind. Everything is purposeful in the Gospels. Every single story, it's not, the miracles are not miracles that prove Jesus is the Son of God or prove that he's God. The miracles are there as as a testimony to how and why he is the Son of God. Every piece of it, every interaction, everything is about the end in mind. So what happens in the story today? 
We're caught up in conversation about children and getting to the kingdom of heaven, and unless you're like a child. And then he starts to seem that he's talking about something just very practical. Someone sins, you go to that person. If they don't get it, you take two or three witnesses with you. If they still don't get it, you bring them before the whole church. If they still don't get it, well, you treat them as if they're a Gentile or a tax collector. What's going on with that? Why is that story placed and dropped right in there? Why would Jesus tie all of that together in the very same conversation? It's because Jesus is saying to us that this topic of sin and accountability and us being able to get along and to be reconciled is part of the kingdom of God. How we live today matters eternally. We begin with the end in mind. The eulogy virtues come first. I've got a lot of experience being a pastor, and I've done a lot of funerals, and I've got to tell you that very few of those funerals focused on someone's resume. And the ones that did, in all honesty, were the saddest ones I've ever attended or ever presided over. When the greatest need for a family is to let someone know where someone went to school 60 years ago. Or the greatest need is for someone to be able to say how busy their father was during the day when he went to work. The kinds of things that build our resumes are the kinds of things that at the end of the day to me just seem to be the saddest, that that's the best we have or most what we remember about someone. The eulogy virtues come first. But for Jesus, it's even more than eulogy. It's about the kingdom of God. I mentioned this to you last week. If you go and look at the Gospel of Mark, you'll see the very first words that Jesus says. The very first words is the kingdom of God is near. In the Greek, he actually says the kingdom of God is in my hand. When Jesus is having this conversation and he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, he's not talking about something that will come later. He's talking about the now, the present. The kingdom of God is the eternal that's here today. That's what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 13, we talk about the love chapter. The great power in that entire chapter for me is this. In the King James, it says, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we will know fully as we are fully known. What Paul is saying is that, yes, there's a cloud or, or, or a veil, but the eternal is here. It's not something we wait for. It's not as if we have, Revelation says, There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Both will be redeemed. It is as if the kingdom of God is here present with us now. It's clouded. It's hard to see. It's not as full as we will know and, and, and be known in it at one point, but it's here now. What we do today matters, not in preparation for where we go, but for the kingdom of God, the eternal that is here for us at this very moment. It's always driving me nuts when people say the B-I-B-L-E, the basic instruction before leaving earth, because it misses so much. It's bad theology. Jesus says the kingdom of God is here. What we do matters now. How we experience things matter as the eternal now. Every interaction with a child at the early service, an older person came up to me and said, you know, it strikes me that um, when you're a parent, you focus on resume virtues. When you're a grandparent, you focus on eulogy virtues. I'll think about that for a long time because I think it is very, very tempting for us when we're raising our children to measure their success by the things we want, we want, we want on their resumes, the schools that we want them to get into, the 
the accomplishments that we desire for them, the things. And you reach a point where you finally realize that if I'm not careful, I'm trading a child for a resume. A beautiful creation of God who's wonderfully and beautifully made, who has the markings of the kingdom of God on her or him. It's so easy to miss. It's so easy to lose in the busyness. It's so easy to miss it in our own lives. And so, I think that the greatest temptation that a Christian faces in the world today especially in our nation. I think this is the greatest temptation that a Christian can face in our nation today. And it has nothing to do about theology and nothing to do about politics. It's this. It is the temptation to believe that God wants me to be happy when we're called to holiness. Now, I'm not saying that happiness is a bad thing. But I'm saying that happiness is measured by the world. What the world says is happy. What I, what I think I should have, what, what the world tells me that I should have, and this disposable culture is this relationship, is this, it's whatever. No, I need, I'm called, God wants me to be happy. And when we do that, we cheat the power of God for us in our lives because God wants so much more. He wants us to be called to holiness. Not as a task, but as an amazing joy. There's something that is so beautiful and powerful in being able to live a life where we know we have done the best that we can to follow what God desires for us in our lives. Even in the hard times, to live into that faithfulness, that's joy. Right now, my favorite book in the New Testament, it changes depending on what book I'm reading, but right now my favorite book in the New Testament, and it often is, you've heard me say this before, is the book of Philippians. Um, why? Well, Paul wrote it. He wrote it to a, a group of believers in Philippi. Paul wrote it while he was in prison in Rome, and Paul was waiting to die. He was imprisoned. He had either been tried and was awaiting ex execution or he was awaiting his trial that he had to know was going to lead to his execution. He begins by saying he doesn't want to be alive. In fact, some people have postulated that perhaps he considered not being alive. But it turns out to be the most powerful, positive letter I have ever read in my entire life. While Paul was in prison, he was guarded by what we call the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard were the, were the SEAL Team 6 of, of the Roman army. They were created, actually, by Caesar to protect Caesar. They were the bodyguards for Caesar. And they were Caesar's greatest fear because they were so close to him and so powerful that they could easily overthrow him. And so the man that creates them and the man that is afraid of them all comes together because of this Praetorian Guard. They were, they were tough and they were in charge and they were arrogant and they were controlling and they knew that they had ultimately all power of the Roman Empire. For some reason, Paul needs to be guarded by the Praetorian Guard as he's in jail. It's bizarre to me, but it must mean that Paul's imprisonment was of high notoriety. It must mean that there was this great fear of him being from the Romans, of him escaping for some reason. This is what he says in the first chapter. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. It's become clear throughout the whole palace guard, the Praetorian guard, and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. In the fourth chapter, Paul actually says that there are people in the household, family members in the household of Caesar who have given their life to Christ because of Paul's witness while he's in prison. I will in no way be ashamed 
but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That has to be the most comforting, joyful, powerful feeling that anyone, anyone can have. And we want happiness. You see, how we live together, how we live together is a witness of the eternal to the world. How we as Christians decide to get along or not get along is a witness of the eternal to the world. It's not just a form of evangelism. It is a a very witness of, of what eternity, what the kingdom of God is. I think this is why Jesus immediately brings forgiveness into this topic in sin. How we learn to relate to each other, how we learn to forgive each other, how we learn to forgive as Christ forgave. Christ forgave us before we even knew we needed forgiveness. While we were yet in our sins, he died for us. How is it that we, as the believers of Christ, do that with each other? How is it that the world sees how we live together? How is it that the world watches and sees us as individuals? Why is it that you get up and go somewhere every Sunday morning, a neighbor may ask? Why is it that there seem to be cars in front of your house People coming and going when the rest of us just live solitary, isolated lives. Why is it that that you seem to be one who can disagree with someone vociferously, politically, and yet you still desire to remain in relationship? Those are the witnesses of the kingdom of God, a witness of the eternal for the world. When I go to Kenya... One of the things I always try to do is I try to spend as much time as I can with a dear, dear friend of mine, one of my best friends, Simon Wongi. Um, and if you know me, you've heard me talk about Simon some. Simon has absolutely no resume. He began to struggle with mental illness in his early teens, was kicked out, dropped out of school, lived on the street. He struggled with many, mental illness all of his adult life. He's been in and out of jobs. He is so ostracized by his community that when they see him walking on the street or the road or the path, they'll immediately cross to the other side to avoid him. He is is one of the least of these as it would be measured by the world. And yet, I still believe he may be Jesus. Every time I'm with Simon, I feel the presence of God. And every time I'm with him, I ask, among other questions, one question every single time. If I see him the next day, I ask the same question. Simon, what are you reading in the Bible? And he will tell me. And he will tell me what it means to him. Whether he's in a season of lucidity and he knows what he's saying and he's clear-headed, or whether he is in a schizophrenic fit where... He doesn't seem to be able to recognize reality from from fantasy. He will tell me what he read in the Bible the last night. And the next day I ask him and he'll tell me what he read that night and the day after and the day after and the day after. And I think of all the people I know in my life. You know, the heroes of your life They're not the people that had the most padded resume, are they? They're the people that you witnessed struggle, fight the slings and arrows of fate, and yet somehow be the ones not only to persevere, but the ones to be able to move forward with joy in life. Those are the heroes for just as Simon is for me. And I think about this incredible opportunity that we have as the followers of Jesus 
is to know that no matter what the world brings to us, we will prevail. That no matter what the world says is happiness, we know of something that is so much deeper. No matter what the world brings, we know that there is something larger. There's something more powerful. The truth is, every single one of you are writing your eulogy today. Every single one of us is writing our eulogy today. What really matters? How do I want to live? What do I want to leave behind? Every one of us, in every choice, in every conversation, in every place, is what we're doing. I pray for you, my friends, as I pray for myself, that we will begin with the end in mind in every conversation, that we will begin with the end in mind in every relationship, in every struggle, in every battle, and we will trust that the kingdom of God is here, and the choices we make, small and large, quotidian, and significant are the choices of the eternal today. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this day. I thank you for making the sun rise this morning and I praise you that the sun of righteousness is raised in our midst. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you call us into a life where we begin at the end to remind us that everything is purposeful in the kingdom of God, to remind us that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, not some day to come, but today. Fill us with the awareness of all the eternity around us. In your beautiful name we pray, amen. Friends, we have the gift in worship to respond to God's word and faithfulness as we seek to live into the kingdom calling on our lives. And we do that in a number of ways. We do that with our prayers and with our tithes and our additional offerings as well. So in a moment, our ushers will come forward and they'll pass the plate. And as they do, I encourage you to place your tithe and your offering in it. There's envelopes in the pew back if you need them. And also consider how you might participate in the Jaycox uniform drive. But also place your connection card with your prayers in it as well. And for those of you worshiping online, there's an opportunity for you to participate in the offering also. Just above where you're watching, there's a button that says give, and you can complete your offering in in that way. And if you haven't shared your prayers with us yet, please fill out a connection card also. Um, You can text to give if you wish by texting the number 530-5683 and following the prompts on the screen. Sisters and brothers, let us continue to worship our Lord.
gracious Lord, for all the many blessings you pour out upon us, we give you thanks. And we ask that you accept and receive these gifts of our tithes, our offerings of our lives, and use them in mighty ways in your kingdom as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue to worship, we gather together in prayer, and as we do, we lift up prayers for our world. We lift up prayers for our brothers and sisters in China, and in particular this week, we're praying for the Outreach Foundation and for Larry Tony and his granddaughter, Hannah, who are visiting there and traveling, that the Lord will bless their work as they are there and bring them home safely. We continue to pray for our friends and our partners in Ukraine. We lift up this opportunity to continue building a relationship with Jay Cox Elementary uh, through this uniform drive, and we pray that each uniform received will be a blessing for the student and the families who receive it. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for the opportunities here to serve before us as the hands and feet of Christ, and in particular this week for our soup kitchen as 17 youth and volunteers gathered yesterday to serve over 62 meals to our guests and uh, to offer a, a short respite in the AC from the, the blistering temperatures outside. We continue to pray for our country and our communities for ends to gun violence and for racial reconciliation. We ask for prayers for a blessing and for the presence of the Lord as we gather tonight for Vacation Bible School. And we continue to lift up prayers for those facing surgery and those who are recovering, as well as the 106 prayer requests that we received last week through our connection cards. Sisters and brothers, let us pray. <coughs> Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day, this day that you have made and we choose to rejoice in it. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together in fellowship, to open your word, and to boldly hear and proclaim the truth of the kingdom. And in particular this morning, we are reminded that the seeking to build the resume of this world is fruitless. And instead, we ought to seek to build our eulogy values, those things which are eternal, those things which, which bring an experience of the kingdom here on earth. So this morning, as we prepare to leave this place, to go out into the world, to go into the relationships that you've brought us into in our family, our friendships, our communities, that in each and every one of these opportunities that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear, courage and boldness to proclaim your truth, to be a witness to your kingdom, to be bearers of your truth and your light and your grace and mercy and your forgiveness, and be present in each relationship that we have as we seek to grow deeper and closer in relationship with you, Lord Jesus. And as we go out, we go out not alone, but as your body, as your community, as your people, and we unite our voices together as we do so, praying in the way that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And I is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
If you're worshiping with us for the first time, we've got a gift for you. Uh, it's a little book by Rick Warren called What on Earth Am I Here For? It's about purpose and meaning. It's really about those eulogy virtues. And it's free. You don't have to sign anything or th shake a hand. If you go out through the narthex, there's a little table up against the wall. The books are there. Take one. If you come this way for coffee and donuts, in the common area, there's a bigger table when the books are there as well. Come back tonight for Vacation Bible School. It's for all ages. We've got great speakers for adults, all kinds of programming for our kids. Meals at 515. That's free. Just come. And uh, classes start at 6. Please be part of that. If you want to hold up anything in prayer, our prayer team has been praying for us throughout this service in our sanctuary. They'll be on the other side of the communion table. Come on up and hold up anything in prayer. And now, sisters and brothers, live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily. And here's the key to it all. Leave everything to the saving grace of our Savior, Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.